Now, in this day is when it's so many different things are happening. I thought it might be interesting just to, and beneficial, just to step back and run through events. Perhaps people looking on the DVD aren't as informed as you. Um, and it might be interesting to take them home. So folks may not know as much as you do. So if I'm talking and teaching my grandmother to suck eggs, I apologize. But I thought it'd be good to run through events that have taken place over the last hundred years or so that to me surely point to the fact that past and current events are the fulfillment of ancient Bible prophecy. And we're heading now for the soon return of the Lord Jesus in glory. Won't that be a great day? I tell you what, that is going to be the royal wedding to end all royal weddings, isn't it? When we meet the Lord Jesus, what a, what a day. I'm going to be singing and dancing that day. That day you will see Bob lift off his feet and dance. You will. Man, dancing in Jerusalem, what a day that will be. Man, me and Mac will be holding hands. <laughs> we will. I'll meet you there. Right. In 1917, the end of the First World War, the Turkish Ottoman Empire that had lasted for almost 500 years and had spread across the Middle East had now gone. In its place, the ruling British Empire and the French began to create nations out of the desert. Do you know that Saudi Arabia was only created in 1932? When Ibn Saud, who'd been paid by the British, actually named the land after himself. The British paid him to do um, different dirty deeds, and so this was his reward. You can get a very interesting book called um, The Secret War Against the Jews. It's about that thick, but it's incredibly interesting. It reads like Jason Bourne. It really does. It's a fascinating book. If you don't know who Jason Bourne is, well, then you're very good because you don't watch worldly movies. But <laughs> Jason Bourne is a spy. So I. Israel and Jordan were also creations of the British Empire. After the First World War, the Balfour Declaration, a British declaration, stated that Palestine would become a home for the Jewish people. Lots of people don't realize how large Palestine was. Palestine was huge. Many of the Jews readily accepted. They accepted this as a move of God. Many of them did. Uh, and many students of Bible prophecy did so as well. They believed that the ancient Hebrew prophets had stated millennia ago that Israel would one day be scattered around the world, but in the latter days, the end days, she would be brought back into her own land. Do you realize Christians have been looking at these scriptures like this for centuries, wondering just how and when these things would take place. People like Isaac Newton, who knew the Jews would go back into their own land, but they just wondered, how ever are they ever, they're scattered around the world, how will they ever get back? You and I are such privileged people to see these things take place. We really are. We are the most privileged generation. We really are. Well, in reaction to this, the Arabs reacted very angrily. So Britain reneged on her promise to the Jews and sliced off more than 70% of Palestine, uh, creating Transjordan, which then later became Jordan. That left the, Jewish, the new Jewish homeland just 50 miles wide, distance between here and Brighton or here to London. That's how wide Israel was. And it was in 1921 when Winston Churchill invented Jordan. Britain also created, they trained, and they led one of the region's most effective armies, known as the Arab Legion. This is the same force that captured the eastern half of Jerusalem in 1948, after, after Israel had declared itself a state with UN approval. The people who actually fought against Israel and captured the, uh, the eastern part of Jerusalem were actually trained by the British. Since that time, the Arab nations have attempted to rid the Jewish nation from its historical homeland on seven occasions, at least. There have been seven major wars, seven major times the Arabs have tried to oust the Jews from the land. Each time they've been defeated by a much smaller Israeli army and air force. Now, this, this has got to be truly the hand of God. It must be, must not it? It must be. No one can study these wars and walk away convinced 
that the Israelis won by overwhelming manpower. They didn't. They should have lost. They should have lost every war they went into. But they didn't. They, they came out victorious from each one. Sometimes they were outnumbered as much as 100 to 1. But they beat them. They won. And they're still there today. All these events... The emergence of the Arab nations, the birth of Israel, they're all leading to one conclusion, a major, major Middle East war, and I believe the appearance of the Antichrist. You know, in around 600 BC in Daniel, six, in Daniel uh, 9.27, you know the prophecy, Daniel 9.27, the prophecy, or Daniel 9, the prophecy of the 70 weeks. In Daniel 9.27, we read the prophecy about a prince or a leader who is going to come and is going to make a covenant or deal or seal a deal, that is rubber stamp something perhaps already existing, with many. With the many, the Bible says. Daniel's told at the start of the prophecy that this prophecy the angel is about to give him concerns his people, the Jews. So we can deduce that the deal this coming leader makes with the many includes Israel, includes the Jewish people. The prophecy also states that the people of this coming prince will destroy the temple and the sanctuary. Now, in AD 70, the Roman legions under Titus destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. So again, using our deductive powers, we can deduce that the prince who is yet to come will arise or at least have his ancestry in and from the old Roman Empire. He is going to be Israel's worst nightmare. He will instigate a persecution of Jews and Christians that will make the Holocaust, well, incredibly evil and wicked as it was, almost pale against it, against the terror, the death, and the destruction he's going to bring to millions. Another clue regarding the Antichrist's origins is found in Daniel 8, where we, we read a prediction concerning the rise, fall, and the division of Alexander the Great, of, of his empire. He came on the scene 200 years after the prophecy concerning him was given to Daniel. In fact, uh, when he was going into Israel, or into the Middle East, a rabbi actually showed him the prophecy concerning him from Daniel. And because of that, he was more favourable toward the Jews. We're shown the rise of the Antichrist in Daniel 8 from one of the four divisions of the empire of uh, Alexander. It's, many, many scholars will say it's from the Seleucid. He had, he had a general called uh, Seleucid. Seleucid? Is it Seleucid? I believe it's Seleucid. It's from the Seleucid area, which covers modern-day Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran all of which are amazingly now anti-Israel. And I believe it's from this area this man will come. Very interesting, the Bible. God doesn't leave you just wondering, does he? He gives you points all the way, like markers. So, within a decade of the birth of Israel, the ancient Roman Empire began to raise its head in the form of the present EU. Now, in Daniel 2, you read the dream of Nebuchadnezzar where he sees the image, gold, silver, uh, bronze, and base metal, iron, in the, in the actual building of the, the image. The, now, people say when you get to the bottom of the image, that is the iron. That is the iron of Rome. Each, each metal in this image is an empire. The Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Greek, and then the Roman. The Roman is the iron part of the image. And when you get to the base of the image, the feet, it, is, it has ten toes. And the Bible speaks repeatedly of a ten-nation or ten-area confederacy at the end of time under the Antichrist. So we're now seeing the rise of the old Roman Empire. So the people say, well, if... if Babylon was immediately followed by the Medo-Persians, and the Medo-Persians were immediately followed by Greece, and Greece was immediately followed by Rome, the Iron Legs. Why is it when you go down the legs, you have to wait for the feet? The revived Roman Empire, the last days. Why, 
why doesn't one just flow naturally into the other? And I wonder, I, I think I may have told you before, I, I did wonder about this. I thought, well, yes, why, why doesn't it? If, if, Bab, if you have this image with all of these metals following it, you know, made up of it, and each metal represents a succeeding empire, why is it that prophecy teachers say, well, Babylon was followed by the Medo-Persians, the Medo-Persians were immediately followed by Greece, Greece was immediately followed by Rome, and those are the legs, and then when you get down to the feet, oh, we've got to stop and wait for the revived Roman Empire of the last days. And I thought, why? Why, why do we stop at the bottom of the legs and wait for these ten toes and the feet? And then I, I believe it's the Lord, because I think I'm too thick to have thought otherwise. But um, <laughs> I, It suddenly came to me one night when I was pondering it. Every one of these empires had one thing in common that the Ottoman Empire, no other empire had in common with them since the time of Rome. You know what that was? Israel. The Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans all dealt with Israel when she was in the land. The moment Israel is thrown out of the land in about 132 AD, Prophecy stops. Suddenly, incredibly, 1948, Israel comes back into the land, declares herself a nation again, and within a decade, the old Roman Empire, the feet start to form. Absolutely astounding. Isn't that amazing? You know, I don't know how anybody can say the Bible isn't exciting. It's an amazing book. It thrills me. So that's where we are. The ancient Roman Empire has begun to raise its head in the form of the present EU. But what a lot of people forget is that the EU has also helped form the Mediterranean Union, which is linked to the EU. This again is amazing because history tells us the Roman Empire had a western leg and an eastern leg, which is why the image had legs. It had an eastern leg and a western leg. So if the old Roman Empire starts to rise itself up within Europe, you should expect that same forming together in the Middle East, and we are seeing that now. So, we have the eastern leg, the western leg, that covered North African coast and the Middle East, exactly where the Mediterranean Union is today. Now, in line with that, the Bible tells us in Zechariah 12 and 14 that in the end times, a whole world is going to come against Israel. This is exactly what we're seeing today with such biased reporting against Israel, it almost beggars belief. Now, what will cause this leader that we mentioned earlier to arise and make some kind of a deal with Israel? There are at least two future wars predicted for Israel. One can be found in Psalm 83, and the second is in Ezekiel 38 and 39. It's interesting that the nations mentioned in Psalm 83 are not mentioned in the Ezekiel prophecy. Could they have been defeated before the Ezekiel War begins? Possibly. Also, when the Ezekiel War begins, it's formed of some very interesting nations, possibly Russia and Turkey, or, or either, and Iran, and other Arab nations will attack Israel. What is very interesting about this is the question that is asked of this latter invading army, the Ezekiel army. In Ezekiel 38, 39, the question is asked, have you come to take a spoil? What benefit could there possibly be in invading Israel in the, in, in the past, apart from the riches maybe in the Dead Sea? Apart from that, there'll be very little to gain. But as the world begins to run out of oil, ah, what is... Uh, as, as the world begins to run out of oil, the desire to, to control and hold what is left will grow. And the country that controls the oil controls the world. So it was with great interest that I read this report from David Silver, who came here before, you remember? And he, wrote, he sent this report from Israel. Because now colleges and supermarkets and elsewhere are being asked to boycott Israeli goods in order to punish Israel for defending herself. You should never do that. You should let, them be over, let yourself be overrun and shoved in the sea. Um, nonsense. This is his report. He said this. 
in the same week the God-haters were making their anti-Semitic voices heard, we received news of a very large natural gas and oil find 50 miles off the coast of Haifa. Upon hearing that news, my heart leapt for joy and I said, Thank you, Lord, as I realized the God of Israel had everything under control and Israel didn't need to worry about the boycotts. However, a few weeks later we were told the report of the size of the gas and oil field was wrong. It was bigger than at first thought. A few weeks later we were told they were wrong again. It was even bigger. Now they're saying it is indeed one of the largest fields of natural gas ever discovered. It's now being reported that there is 16 trillion cubic feet of natural gas and about 4 billion barrels of oil under the seabed off the coast of Haifa. They also recently announced the discovery of an oil field in the centre of the country and another oil field under the sand of the desert in southern Israel. There could be several billion barrels of oil in each of these locations. And now we're hearing reports of the discovery of massive deposits of oil shale. That is a kind of rock that contains oil inside it, but to extract the oil from the rock usually involves a process that is very damaging to the environment and requires enormous quantities of water, which Israel doesn't have, of course. However, thank the Lord, it now seems that Israel <laughs> has invented a new process which separates the oil from the shale while it is still deep underground, eliminating pollution and environmental damage, and rather than using water, it produces water. It was first reported that there are 4 billion barrels of oil in the shale, but now they are saying it could be as much as 250 billion barrels of oil. Israel may have as much, if not more, oil now than Saudi Arabia, a fact that will have a major political impact in the Middle East and further afield. In the next few years, Israel will not only become energy self-sufficient, she will also become a major energy exporter. So you can see why, as oil runs out in other places, this new find, they're going to want to grab that. The West is going to want it. Russia is going to want it. China is going to want it. They're, and isn't it interesting that in the book of Revelation, all these nations come down. Why? Now you know why. Now you see why. So he finishes by saying this, So come on, all you boycotters. Be my guest. Boycott Israel. But if you're going to do so, please do it properly. Give up your cell phones, your mobile phones. That's an Israeli Jewish invention. Give up your computers. Computers are a Jewish invention. Give up your memory sticks. That's a Jewish, those are Jewish inventions. Give up most of your medicines and your medical imaging equipment because they were invented by Jews. Give up your remote controls on your TV because they were invented by Jews. Or oh, throw your Levi jeans away too because Levi jeans are a Jewish invention. And your lipstick, ladies. Lipstick was a Jewish invention. Give up much of your music, give up much of your movies from Hollywood and your literature. Go back and live in the dark ages, he said. Come on now, Mr. Boycotter and Mrs. Boycotter, don't be a two-faced hypocrite. If it comes from Israel or the Jewish people, why not give it up? I dare you. You know, there is a growing hatred of Israel and that hatred originates from Satan himself. We're able to look at these events and we're able to discern the time is short. And if we can do so, so can Satan. He's not stupid. His IQ is far exceeds ours. He knows this man, his le this leader, the Antichrist, is about to make his appearance. This will be Satan's last chance to rid the world of the Jewish race and the believers in Jesus. But he will fail. His reign of terror will last just a few short years and then Christ will return in glory and power and execute judgment on the Antichrist and all his followers will set up his own kingdom from Jerusalem. The events we are witnessing today are fulfillments of ancient prophecies and we can see them taking shape. The stage is being set for the final act. Don't we live in amazing days? We really do. But, you know, folks watching on the DVD or hearing it on a CD, where do you stand? You know, all men are sinners. It'd be pointless me coming here and speaking about Bible prophecy to the converted with, without giving the gospel, the good news. You have to finish with the good news. The good news is Jesus is coming. And the good news is if you are not a Christian, you can become one now. 
Jesus Christ came to die in your place, taking your punishment. You do not have to go to hell forever. By accepting Christ's forgiveness and having him come and live, into your heart, live in your heart today, you can be given a new life today. Only a fool wants to go to hell. But by refusing Christ's substitution in your place, you're actually saying, I choose to take my own punishment. That punishment is eternal, and once in, there is no way out. The door will be closed behind you. These ancient prophecies are not Mickey Mouse stories. This book has been around for centuries. It is the anvil that has worn out many hammers, and it is all coming true today. These are building up to the return of Christ, and these are facts that are borne out in your daily newspapers and on your TV. If you're not a Christian, come to Christ today while you can. And for the believer, I think it's time to start looking up and getting ready. The Lord is certainly coming. God bless you, brothers and sisters. Thank you. Thanks, Bob.